Hello everyone. I hope you remember that during lecture number one, I talked a little bit about how this course is going to emphasize three elements. We're going to do the intuition to try to give everybody a way to think about stuff in terms they're familiar with. We're also going to do formal mathematical things so that we get a, a new set of tools to apply to machine learning. And lastly, we're going to talk about implementation because implementations always matter and uh, you know theory is great but practice is important. So I'm doing this short video to give you a little bit of a combination of the intuition and implementation on the question of what are inputs, what are features, what are the differences between them, and how do we operate with them. Okay, This is just a taster uh, it's giving you an idea of how things work. Uh, clearly, details matter, and there's a lot more complexities to be explored in the next uh, several weeks. So, I'm giving you this, uh, this view of me doing a live Jupyter Notebook. The language is Python. And if you are unfamiliar with Jupyter Notebooks or Python, don't panic. There's a load of really good online tutorials to help you catch up. Uh, I will put some links on Canvas that I suggest for people who need catch up uh, information. So let's rewind. At the end of lecture number one, I flashed a slide up just because basically I ran out of time, let's be honest. Um, that was about what defines features? What is the difference between features and the input? How do we compute them, evaluate them, use them? Okay. Evaluate features is way too complex a topic for right now, so we're just going to skip that. But I'm going to give you at least a taster of what the rest of these mean. So to do that, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to highlight a few wonderful capabilities of Python as we go through this. Okay. So the pandas library is amazing. If you operate on data in Python, it is the way to go. Between pandas library in Python and the data frame in R, you, if you master those tools, you will be much happier as somebody doing machine learning or data science. They are amazingly powerful ways to deal with the crap that inevitably comes with data. Data is noisy. It has missing values. It has, uh, you know, somebody accidentally put a zero in ASCII in instead of a zero numerically, right? These things are in every data set. They require your attention before you can do the fun part, the machine learning stuff. So pandas is the tool of choice when you're in the Python world. And like I said, the data frame is an R. So we're just going to very quickly uh, import a bunch of tools that we need to do this job. One of the cool things about Python, uh, sorry, one of the cool things about pandas is that it has the ability to read data from on the internet. So we're just going to grab some data here about wine uh, and let's take a look at it. So, so when we read this off the web here, what we've got is a bunch of columns where each column uh, represents one kind of variable. So this is the percent alcohol here in the first column. And uh, these are grams per liter of malic acid and various other things that they can measure about the wine. So each column is a variable about wine and each row is a sample, a particular wine that's been measured. So maybe we have a task where we're trying to predict something about this wine. And these are the variables that somebody has given us to predict with. Well, let's take a look at these variables because I, you know, if you've taken a bit of data science -y sort of stuff, you know you have to look at your data in the rawest format possible to see what's going on. And if you don't do that, you're going to get yourself in trouble sooner or later. So Pandas has this wonderful little histogram feature. So we're just going to take the data we downloaded and for every one of these variables, we're going to create a histogram. Okay, let me scroll up so you can see all the histograms. All right. So 
recap for those that are not familiar, a histogram shows you what are the natures of these measurements that are in the data, okay? So let's take a look at, say, ash here. Ash has a shape that looks reasonably like a normal distribution. It seems like the value is largely between zero and maybe three and a half. Okay, so those are the low measurements are around zero, high measurements around three and a half. By far, the vast majority of measurements kind of exist in this kind of two to three range with what looks like the mean or median might be around, say, 2.4. Okay, that's just eyeballing off the histogram. We can use pandas, of course, to get the actual mean and median and other descriptors of the distribution. Okay, so the y-axis shows how many measurements are here at about 2.4. The answer is there are 50-some measurements at that value. All right. So that's what a histogram is. We can look at all of these variables. And you can see a few things. Um, some things look normal-like. Some things don't. I would say that malic acid here looks distinctly like it's probably exponential family distribution. So let's imagine we're using this data to do some kind of machine learning with. Um, you we will find out through the course of the, the uh, quarter that machine learning techniques, various algorithms, have assumptions about the data where they work better. Okay, And some machine learning algorithms will assume that it's a normal distribution. And something that's exponentially distributed will not give ideal performance with, right? It's designed to work with normal data. So we should maybe see about transforming this input data into a feature representation, okay? One which is better suited for whatever algorithm we're going to apply that requires normal data distribution. So that is one answer to this question. What is the difference between inputs and features? Sometimes you transform inputs into more usable features that are better for the machine learning algorithm that you're applying. Okay? So, one way we might do that is if we have some normality problems or if we have skewed distributions, then uh, a very common technique in the statistical literature is we can log the data. We just simply take whatever the data numbers are, we take their log instead of the raw data numbers. So, Pandas provides us with a lovely way to do that. So we can just use the apply function, which will take each column and log that column, and then do that for every column in the data. Okay, So we can do that. We can get log versions of the wine data and plot those histograms. All right, so our very non-normal malic acid, let's try to get them both on the screen at once. So this is the malic acid. Actually, it occurs to me I should check to make sure that OBS captures the pointer. Yeah, it doesn't, of course. All right. So um, if you look on the top right of the screen, that's the malic acid. I'll just kind of scroll on a little bit. You can see that originally it was non-normal. And if you now look at the bottom right of the screen, you can see the log transformed version of the malic acid. And you can see it's significantly more normal looking. Okay, Certainly it doesn't have that very classic exponential shape to it anymore. So maybe we've made this data good enough for uh, whatever algorithm we're doing that assumes normality. We can do one more thing to this data. If you look at the numbers, you can see that like magnesium now with a log transform has got highs of five, whereas other numbers have, say, highs of one. Now, some algorithms are going to end up assigning more weight to variables that have higher absolute values. So if you don't, if you use some sorts of unnormalized algorithms, they're going to assume that whatever is in the thousands or the tens of thousands is way more important to the problem than whatever numbers are in the ones or the tens. Okay, so 
another standard technique that's often employed with wacky data where variables don't have the same scale to them is to turn them all into a standard normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, okay? So we can do that to all of these by using a lovely little piece of the scikit-learn uh, library. We're going to see a lot more of scikit-learn over the course of the quarter. I don't want you to get wrapped up in the details of what I'm doing here. I want you to just understand that what we're doing is transforming the data into a, the, input, the raw inputs into a set of features that are better suited to a particular machine learning algorithm to operate on. Okay, so details don't matter, ideas do. So we're going to transform this log line into a standard distribution for each one of those data sets. Okay, each one of those variables. So now, um, now you can see that malic acid, let's go back over here. So top right again is malic acid log transformed. It now is not so distinctly logarithmically distributed. Sorry, it's not so distinctly exponentially distributed. And instead, it has a more normal-like shape. But here, the values go between minus something and, I don't know, like not quite two. Here, malic acid has now been transformed into a standardized normal distribution where it has mean zero and standard deviation of one and none of the uh, measurements are much more than a bit beyond minus two or plus two standard deviations away from the mean. And most importantly, all the variables now have been transformed into this mean of zero and uh, you know one standard deviation is the value one. Okay? Now they're all much more comparable. Any variable that maybe before had numbers in the tens of thousands and any variable that had vari numbers in the ones now are in the same scale. So various algorithms that, that can care about unweighted values too much uh, are now going to not overweight one variable versus the other in terms of trying to solve the problem. So if this is confusing, we, can, we will definitely cover it again. But uh, again, let's back up. The big idea here is that raw data may be incompatible with the algorithm you're trying to apply. We are going to learn over the course of the quarter with every algorithm what the assumptions are, what kinds of variable uh, formats it needs, and when necessary, you will transform data when you're trying to apply these algorithms using techniques like this. So that's one answer to the question of what is the difference between inputs and features. Features may be engineered versions of the inputs that are better able to be learned with. Okay? So, and um, a way to give you some intuition about this is to create uh, something that maybe a human can't quite see the pattern in and then give you a new way to view the data, a transformed way of the data that you can view. Okay? Here is a matrix, a matrix of zeros and two hundreds. I will generate it here. So if I tell you that this is a grayscale image, can you visualize what that grayscale image looks like? Now that you've had a second, I hope that you can answer. It's going to be two boxes one in a lighter color and one in a darker color, okay? Where the zero in classic grayscale is black and 255 is white. So here in this next cell, I'm going to plot that, as a, that same matrix as a grayscale image between zero and 255, okay? So you can see black, light gray, that's the zeros are the black, the light gray is the, is the 200s. Okay, so you could visualize that from the raw data, but your, your mind doesn't really work the way RGB pixels work, okay? So let's show you here. This tuple, well, list actually, is three zeros represents black in RGB space, 
right? This is red, this is green, this is blue value. So zeros all across mean black, no light. Uh, yellow, uh, so in, in uh, the light, when you do light instead of paint, yellow is red and green mixed together. Sorry, no, it's green and blue, right? I get confused. I didn't take art. So um, whichever way around, these are the RGB values for yellow. So 255, um, Seems to me it's gotta be red and green because I'm pretty sure this is R, G, and then B. All right, so here is an array now where the pixels are black, 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 yellow, yellow, black, 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 across the top of the, the, the matrix, the image. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you here, if I generate this, can you visualize what that is. Pretty sure the answer is no. It's also a lot easier to see in the, even in the blue yellow space, where it's a lot easier to see than in the RGB space, where this is the first row. And then if I scroll up a little bit, that's the second row of the image. And there's the third row of the image with RGB, right? This is a representation that the human mind doesn't readily comprehend, right? It's in a feature space, which doesn't work for a biological learning algorithm, right? For you. <laughs> but if I transform those numbers into a feature space that you readily comprehend, then it's much easier for you to see what it is present in those numbers. Okay, so that's the intuition here. Machine learning algorithms are no different than you, right? There are representations that they are better suited for. Now, for something like images, which are something that will very commonly crop up in machine learning stuff, um, we need to transform this kind of uh, image that's good for us into a representation that's good for the machine. So let's go backwards from the smiley face uh, icon here to a machine learning friendly version of it. So um, I have created, when I created the image, I created a numpy array. Numpy arrays have a lovely function flatten. And what they do is it's going to take this array, which is RGB for pixel one, RGB for the next pixel along, RGB for the pixel after that, all the way across the top row. So it's row major, RGB. So row, the first row, red, green, blue, pixel one, red, green, blue, pixel two, red, green, blue, pixel three, etc. Now, uh, we're going to flatten that by reading out those numbers sequentially. So that's what this does. And now we have a vector. It is a vector which is, uh, since it's three measurements per pixel, and there's 10 pixels by 10 pixels, it's 300 numbers long. Red, green, blue for pixel one, etc. So now this vector representation can become an input for a particular sample, for sample number one, okay? Well, let's add sample number two. I don't wanna go through manually specifying images again, so I'm gonna load one. So here is a nice emoji. And I'm going to transform this emoji because this emoji came to us in a giant shape, which is much bigger than my 10 by 10 image. So if I'm going to throw both of these into a data set to do something machine learning with, they need to be the same size. So I'm going to take this 150 pixel by 150 pixel image and convert it into a 10 by 10 pixel version of it, and then flatten it out into this vector representation the same as before. So, whoops neglected to undo this thing. So, there we go. Here are the numbers, red, green, blue on pixel zero, then pixel one, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna create a data set because now I have two, two different samples. To, so it's a set, right? Two samples. <laughs> so uh, a nice way to do that again is that Pandas offers you a way to 
put together two things. You can also do it with numpy matrices. So um, I'm just going to do this. So now we have the smiley entry, those 300 numbers going across on a row, and the party popper entry, 300 numbers going across on a row. And we can feed this kind of a representation into whatever algorithm we're using very easily. Okay? So that is a case where we're using the raw input data or work in the case of image number two, we're downsizing the image to make them consistent with the first image. And that's, you know, all of this comes into the category of pre-processing your data so that the machine learning algorithm can do its job. Um, and lastly, just to show you, when we did the standardization of the wine data, log transform and then standard normalizing it, um, we can look at the same thing here, right? We can look at those raw numbers. Here are the columns, are the variables, and here are the samples going down this way. So that is all I had for you right now in this video. There's going to be another video where we're going to go and cover the basic math, which is going to be used throughout the course. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will definitely put this notebook for people to see in on Canvas. Um, the part of it with the party popper won't work unless you download a party popper PNG, but I'm sure you can handle that. And more to the point, again, don't get hung up on details. Let's concentrate on the intuitions here, and then we're going to paint in the details over the course of the quarter. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.